Hey, what's up? It's Coach PR holding down for Vlad TV. Got a special guest. Uh, this is going to be very interesting. Very interesting conversation. Dr. Myron Roll. What's up, bro? How you doing? How you doing? Are you, can I call you doctor? Should I call you Myron? Which one? Which one you prefer? Uh, Dr. Roll is fine. Dr. Roll is cool. Doctor always works. I just want to make sure. Be respectful. We're going to keep this respectful. All right? You ready? Let's ride. All right. Now I know that you, uh, your, you, your parents. You, were you born in the Bahamas? No, no. So my parents, my brothers were. Uh, my mommy was eight months pregnant with me in the Bahamas, but wanted me to be a U.S. and a Bahamian citizen. So she flew over to uh, Houston, Texas, had me, and then went back to the Bahamas for about three years, uh, and then we eventually permanently moved to Jersey. So I uh, got both citizenships and got love in both countries. Okay. Why, 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 why Texas? And then you know, were, were your family living in Texas first, and then? Yeah, so no, my, my mother had, uh, had some friends from high school who were living in Houston, and she just literally needed a place to stay, a house, you know, a shelter, a roof over her head in order to have me. Uh, and then New Jersey was basically because my father was working for Citibank in Nassau, and then uh, they had a, a job opening in New York City or Luxembourg in Europe. So my mommy said, we're not going to Europe, we're going to America, and that's why mm. the family moved up to the U.S., Okay, and uh, you were raised in, uh, after that you moved to Jersey. What part of Jersey? It was a uh, Galloway Township, right? That's right. Nice neighborhood. Yeah, nice, nice neighborhood. Nice. I, I hear that they officially, in 2009, uh, it's officially like, you know, December 10th is uh, your day. Is it Dr. Myron Roll Day or is it just Myron Roll Day? Just Myron Roll Day. That was before the Dr. Moniker came. Before the doctor. You got to have them change that now, man. You have to <laughs> change that. Okay, so your youngest of five, right? That's correct. As Marchant, Marvis. I want you to say Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai. 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 And McKinley, right? All names start with M. It seems like that's like, is this a West Indian thing? Because like all my brothers, you know, my parents are Jamaican. It starts with C. The initials are CBE. <laughs> you have the same initials too? Or is it just the uh, first name? Just, just, the, just the first name. Yeah. Okay. So that's just my parents anyway. Whatever. <laughs> so, um, and you're related to uh, Entree Roll. You got a couple of roles that were in the, that was in the NFL. Yeah, that's well, right. All you cousins? Not, all cousins, that's right? That's right. Antrell, Brian, Samari. Um, you know, we all come from Exuma, Bahamas, where uh, there was a slave owner named Lord John Roll from Great Britain that uh, had uh. a bunch of slaves in this particular plantation in Exuma, one of our family islands. And once slavery was abolished, all the slaves took his last name. Uh, and so that's where we all originate from. So uh, it's a blessing to have all those guys. And we're all very close. Wow. So there must be a lot of roles in, uh, in the Bahamas. Then. A lot, yeah. It's like for you guys in the NFL, like, wow. Okay, let's get to it. Like, uh, tell me about, you know, you coming up as, you know, you have immigrant parents. How was that, you know, going to school and, you know, because I know they were very strict on you, right? For going to school, getting, being, you know, getting a job, working. Yeah, you know, my parents, uh, they are amazing. Uh, Whitney and Beverly, they met when they were eight years old, uh, started dating at 15 and married at 21. And they've been married for 50 years now. Uh, and then coming to mm -hmm. America, they knew that the opportunity for us, me and my older brothers, to be great citizens, great leaders, great thinkers uh, was important. And, and they put a premium on education so that we could be uh, whatever we wanted to be in a, a country that they felt had an abundance of resources for us. Coming from the Bahamas, we understood that we were leaving paradise and sunshine, beach and family. Uh, but this was an opportunity that we weren't to be complacent with. So anytime when I was going up through elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, the premium was placed on education, being a student first, and athletics sort of just came with it because I was good at it, tall, big, fast, and strong, but the absolute focus in my household growing up was school, academics, intellectual prowess, and making sure that led the way uh, instead of sports and athletics, for sure. Now, um, going to school, when you went to elementary school, I see something happen. You had an a incident, altercation. And were you, uh, you called some names then? Because I know growing up for me, the, you know, the, uh, back then it was easy to be called coconut or whatever, coming from the banana boat or whatever. Did you get that kind of abuse or was it something else that had you go into that altercation? No, that's exactly it. You know, I, I think my older brothers, uh, they took the credence from my parents a little bit better than I did. You know, I was sort of, uh, I was the youngest and I had a bit of a temper, anger. Uh, and if I got called a racial epithet, if somebody talked about the Bahamas where I'm from or talked about my parents, especially my mommy, you know, I'm very close to my mother, uh, then, you know, that would run me red, run me hot. And so one day when I was 10 years old, a young man 
uh, violated two of these things, called me the N-word and called my mother the B-word. And um, mm. oh, I man. just went, grabbed him, beat him up. He ended up having to go to uh, the hospital and the clinic for his injuries. His parents took me and my family to uh, Atlantic City Courthouse, which was 20 minutes away from where I grew up, uh, to talk about this and hopefully get some punishment for me in that respect. And I remember standing there as a 10-year-old with my suit on, looking at this judge and him telling me and admonishing me for my behavior. And I remember turning around in that courthouse, looking at my mother's face, looking at my father's face, seeing the disappointment that was on their face, seeing the doubt and the concern that we may be sent back to the Bahamas. I mean, all sorts of things were running through their head. But the fact yeah. that, you know, I had a, a, a wonderful lawyer, I had a grace of God, had some community advocates that came and talked to my behalf. I was able to walk out of that courtroom with nothing on my, uh, on my permanent record, shake the young man's hand, do some community service. Uh, but I really feel like at that point, is when I changed and made the shift and, and said, I can be a good student and a good athlete, but if my behavior doesn't match these two areas of my life, then there would be no progress in me. And so I started to join extracurricular activities. I started to get, I gave my life to Christ. I was a much different person and made a pivot at that point in my life. And I think uh, it's you know a blessing that I was able to go through that moment, rebound, and recover some of the, um, you know, the potential that I had and then continue to move forward. And that's, uh, that's what happened. And that was at 10. Was that with the store owner or was that a different incident? Uh, that was a different incident. I was a young man who I went to school with. He was a classmate of mine on a bus. Okay, okay. And that was at 10 years old. So what happened with the store owner following you around uh, um, in Jersey? Yeah, you know, th this would happen quite often with me uh, and my friends. You know, I had some friends who were white uh, or non-black and we'd go into a store and uh, that, you know, my, my white friend would lead the way and I would see how the response to him uh, would be a lot more amicable. They would say hi, they would ask if he needed help or they'd just let him roam the store. But with me, mm -hmm. they would question me, pepper me, uh, wonder if what I was doing there, if I wanted to buy something, uh, if I wasn't gonna buy that I should leave. You know, it was a lot more hostile towards me. And, you know, growing up in New Jersey, but also having a foot in the Bahamas where it's 90, 95% black people look like me, I had a very keen understanding and incredibly sensitized to the microaggressions uh, that could be around us. And so I felt that as a young person and I knew that, you know, these were people who were ignorant um, and I couldn't sort of succumb to uh, that attitude because it would lower me and bring me to a place uh, that maybe I couldn't rebound from. And so uh, I think at that point, I had to focus on my future, focus on why I was here, focus on having success and allowing that to be the retribution for the type of treatment that I would receive in those stores and such. So at 13 now, I see that you ran a, a, a 40 under five seconds. That's at 13. That's right. It's, is that the point where you said to yourself like, okay, this, this is where I could start playing sports, or was it before that that made you get into it? Because the 13 run the 40 under five, that's... Yeah, you know, I think that uh, I felt that I could play uh, football at a high level even before that. Um, I would dominate my opponents, you know, not to sound, you know, incredibly confident or, you know, full of hubris, but I was having a lot of success. Just rolling the football in the field naturally I like to be aggressive. I like to hit. Mm -hmm. um, I like to win. I was very competitive. If you ran faster than me, then I was trying to run faster than you the next time we had an opportunity. All this thing was sort of inside of me. So at that point, I realized uh, that I had potential here. And understanding that Samari and Antra, my older cousins, were out there doing great things in college and the pros, I always saw myself going in that direction. But it wasn't until I was around 14 years old when I went to um, a camp at the University of Oklahoma to compete mm -hmm. against people who weren't in New Jersey, weren't in the Northeast, weren't in my local vicinity. These are national recruits getting recruited by the number one school in the country. Uh, when I went out there and I balled out and I ended up getting a scholarship, that's when I realized that, yeah, I can really do this thing at the college level and maybe even beyond. Because at, at that same time, you were actually playing the saxophone and singing too, right? In the school band. So was it trying to like one outweigh in the other way? Or you knew, you know what? I'm going to play football and forget about the music. Because it could have been a doctor, a singing doctor. <laughs> you could have kept on going. But when was that, you know, a hard decision for you to make? You know, it, it really wasn't. I, I felt that being a, a musician and, and being a thespian and being a student government and building homes for Habitat for Humanity and volunteering with my... Uh, 
my local church and being a, a member of the community and trying to serve. I think all these things coexisted in my body and informed the other aspects of my person. So if I was able to communicate and get along with people who were involved in a church, involved in music, involved in drama, involved in all these different areas of school, I definitely could communicate with other guys who are gonna be on my team who came from different backgrounds, different experiences. So the ability to communicate, the ability to lead, the ability to get along and be a team player, all these things work together and intertwine. So I never looked at the journeys as being separate. I looked at them as coexisting and intertwining mm. into each other and helping each other okay. along the way. Okay. Now you transferred to Hunt, Hunt School of Princeton and play high school football and basketball. Still maintain your 4.0 GPA. Great. Now you have basketball and, and football. Still the decision. I'm still doing football regardless. Yeah, I, I got a lot more attention for football. I mean, when I got my first scholarship offer as a freshman from Oklahoma, the week after that was Purdue, and after that, Notre Dame, Rutgers, Michigan, and it was like a snowball effect. For basketball- oh, That was a no-brainer then. It was a no-brainer. I, I, I realized <laughs> that, yeah, this was gonna, football was gonna be it. I liked playing basketball, I liked running track. I liked having my other muscle groups being worked, and I just enjoyed being active. I never wanted to take a season off. I see a lot of young people now who play sports. They specialize in one sport at the age of eight, and I'm like, you know, I, I feel that you gain more if you're able to do more early and sort of learn different muscle groups and different movements and different exercises. Mm -hmm. And once you do specialize and once you do sort of focus on one particular sport, you'll be better for it because you have lighter feet, you have better hand-eye coordination, you have better balance, whatever it may be. So I played all those sports, but I knew football was going to be the one to take me over. All-American, 112 tackles, including 14 for loss. That's all through your high school, right? Now, now you like the number one, you're the number one prospect in the country. How's that feel, bro, to be the number one prospect in the country? Well, it, felt, it felt great. You know, it felt like a lot of work that I put in um, as a young person in the summer when my teammates would go to the beach. Uh, I would work out with a professional. We had this guy named Pete Hunter. He lived near my brother McKinley and I, and he would take us out to Atlantic City Boardwalk, work us out, run, train. I was on this grind. I was on this mission to continue to get better even when I was younger. I loved the grind. I loved competing. And that was something that really fueled me. Uh, and to, to, to hear my name called as a number one high school recruit was a fantastic thing for me, my family, the Bahamas, and even my school. See, the high school I went to was a boarding school, cost thirty four, mm. thirty five thousand dollars a year to go there. So they're not used to like big time athletics and a lot of attention from an athletic side of things. And all these coaches mm. who were coming through our doors, Lloyd Carr, Pete Carroll, Steve Spurrier, Urban Meyer, Bobby Bowden, Joe Paterno, Charlie Weiss, the, the name just kept rolling. And our school wasn't really prepared for this. They were sending kids to Hobart <laughs> and Williams and Tufts and Smith and Vassar, but they weren't ready for right. a USC to be walking through the door, Ohio State. And so that was a little bit different for them, but you know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. Recruiting was a lot of fun. I got to travel the country, see a lot of people, meet new people, experience new things, and, uh, and do it alongside my family, which was the best part about it. Um, a lot of players, especially at that, that age, a lot of young players, right, it tends to get their head all big and swollen up and they run around losing focus. How did you maintain your focusness, especially, you know, you got number one, 12th play, best player, top athlete overall. Like you have all these accolades and they're in they, and, and a recruiting class, looking at coaches looking at you. How do you still maintain focus? Like, because you're in, still in school now. <laughs> with your friends at a young age. Yeah, that's that's a that's an easy one. You're you're a Caribbean man as well. Uh, you understand, you know, when when we come from families that will humble you quickly, regardless of how successful you may be. Uh, that uh, that's a point that was never lost on me. Uh, anytime I would go run for three or four touchdowns and make eight tackles and have an interception, come home and I still have to do my my chores, still got to take out the trash, still have to do all <laughs> the things, <laughs> you know, as a younger brother right. would do. And so that was never lost upon me. And I think another thing that kept me humble was my relationship with Christ. I told you I gave my life to Christ after I was right. fighting as a young person. The humility that comes with understanding that things can be taken from me tomorrow and this blessing of life and these gifts and talents that I have uh, are not something to be played with. God gave me these. I need to use it to the best of my ability, but understand I should cherish them because 
anything could happen. And so I, I remain humble, understanding that I have somebody who protects me and loves me in my Christ, but also my family, making sure that my two to my, my 10 toes are on the ground, two feet on, on the, the ground, ground. recognizing uh, who I am. And, and that was helpful for me. Myron, come take out the trash. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And no, de- right? and, still got to do that. No debate, no debate. Not like a question, like, "Oh, well, I'm the number one player mm-hmm. in the country." No, no, no. You go do it. No. Get it done. That's right. Then you go do your uh, your workout plan and everything, whatever you had to do. Um, how did how did you make the decision to go to FSU now, Florida State? Right. That's right. Yeah. You know, I uh, I thought about FSU long and hard. I, I had 83 scholarship offers and. FSU was a place that I think could grow me as an athlete, student, philanthropist, leader, Christian. Uh, you know, I, I also felt that if I went to Michigan or Stanford or Notre Dame, I'd be another smart student athlete. But if I went to Florida State, I'd be the student athlete that they would highlight, exalt, put in front mm-hmm. of the governor, put in front of boosters and really help um, give me the opportunity to be you know, an outstanding scholar athlete. I also wanted to win a road scholarship when I got to college. So Florida State talked to me about that on my recruiting visit, how you can mature as a student here to put yourself in a good position to win this scholarship that not a lot of people get, but we want to put our resources and activate our individuals around you so that you can win this scholarship and not only represent yourself, but represent our university because we're typically known as Uh, a party school or maybe not a high academic achieving school. But if you win as an All-American football player, you can really set us apart. And so there was a lot riding on it, but I appreciated that relationship, that synergy that I had. I knew I wanted something out of FSU. FSU wanted something out of me and we worked together and uh, made it happen. That's great. You also won the the Franklin D. Watkins Memorial Trophy, which is a premier African-American scholar athlete award in American high um, high school for um, high school males. So was that from, that was before you got to college and you won that. So that was like, uh, should I say like really enticing to Florida FSU to see that they have this, this scholar and actually this young scholar coming here too, right? Absolutely. You know, I think Florida State noticed it. Uh, when I went on my recruiting visit, um, you know, I had a, a wonderful time at FSU walking into the cafeteria. They were playing this song. Uh, by the big timers, everybody get your roll on. Everybody, yeah. everybody get your roll, get your roll. on. So, well, roll, yeah, right? so, so the last name, I mean, I was like, man, this is amazing. And then I walk and sit down and I'm sitting next to our president of our university who literally just had a concussion earlier in that day, but he knew that I was coming to dinner that night. So he told the Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, you got to discharge me because I got to see this guy, Myron Roll. So sit next to him, sit next to Bobby Bowden, the legendary football coach. Uh, the governor of Florida at the time was Jeb Bush. You know, his dad and his brother were presidents of the United States. They texted me and said, you know, Myron, it would be wonderful if you came to Florida State. So I got the governor. I got our president. I got the head coach. I got all the great players here. They're playing my oh, theme that was song. Coach Bi- Bowden was, uh, was the coach at that time, Yeah, right? Coach Bobby Bowden was Bobby our head Bobby, coach. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. So so the so the the whole experience was fantastic. And, uh, and yes, understanding that I was a, a true student first, uh, and then I really prioritized that. Winning the Watkins Award and other awards like that uh, really just – set me apart and made sure that FSU understood uh, that I wasn't here to play. I, I, I made kid, but I wasn't here to play. And it was time to get busy in class as well as on the field. Did you stay your whole four years at uh, FSU? I didn't. I graduated with my yeah. undergraduate degree in two and a half years because I entered college with yeah. a lot of credits. So I finished right. in two and a half. And then after my third year, I won the Rhodes Scholarship, which took me over to Oxford University. So I never played four years, only played three years. Uh, and uh, then after Oxford, came back and got drafted in the NFL. Okay. Now for the draft. Since you're a number one prospect in the country, high school, and then you go down real low in, uh, in, the, in the draft. How did you, how did you take that? Well, it was difficult. Now, by, by the, te- by the uh, Tennessee Titans, right? Correct. Yeah, it was, it was difficult for sure because I had a very, very successful college career. Okay. After Oxford, did you go right into NFL draft or go back to school? Or how did that happen? Yeah. So when I won the Rhodes Scholarship was my junior year at Florida State. And, um, you know, when you win the Rhodes Scholarship, it's the highest academic award in all of uh, college, really. And not a lot of college athletes get it. So uh, at the same time, I was highly sought after in the NFL where some projections were saying I was going to be a first or second round draft pick. I was having a right. great season, all American, all ACC, AC, ACC defensive rookie of the year, my freshman year. So had a lot of good momentum going into the NFL. Uh, I asked people what I should do. 
Uh, should I go to the NFL right now as a first round pick? Or should I take the Rhodes Scholarship and go to Oxford? Many people said I should go as an NFL player because you have such a transient window to play that sport. You know, you don't want to miss that chance. But I thought long and hard about it. I prayed and I said, you know what? If I'm going to be a leader, if I want to set myself apart from other individuals, uh, and if I want to help inspire people, I'm going to choose education over athletics. And so I went to Oxford, got my master's degree in medical anthropology, spent a year and a half over there, came back, didn't go back to college. I went and entered the NFL draft and got drafted oh, okay. in the sixth okay. round instead of the first round, made $50,000 guaranteed signing bonus instead of $7 million, and was a 53rd mm -hmm. man on the roster playing three years instead of eight, nine, or 10 years, as was projected. So definitely was a sacrifice on an athletic side of things by choosing that Oxford Road versus the NFL. But if I had to make the choice again, make it today, 10 times over, I'd make the same choice every single time. You do the same choice over again. Wow. I would. I would. You know, I, I think that it, um, when I hear young people now come up to me and tell me that they've used my story as fuel or as inspiration uh, to go and be better and to go and improve themselves or place themselves in a position as a leader, uh, it really makes the decision worth the while. And I wrote about it in my book, The 2% Way, where I, I talk about struggling with these challenges of feeling like you're letting people down or you're not you know, meeting the expectations that people have for you. You know, I was, as you mentioned, and we talked about, I was either at the top or near the top of all of my class in high school, college, and now the NFL. And, and, and the NFL, I, I felt short of the success that I had in my prior seasons as a, as, mm. a, as a football player. But I think that leaving the game after three years, being healthy, not having any concussions, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. My hands were good enough so I can go on to be a neurosurgeon at Harvard like I am now. So all these things work together for the good. And, and I write about how I took this sort of small step, 2% way process in, in getting to, to that moment and to that point. And seeing young people be inspired by the story definitely makes you feel rewarded uh, for that decision. Were you worried at any moment since it was like 255 uh, players in that draft you were drafted, what, 207th. Were you worried at uh, some point that I might not get drafted? Oh, no question. No question. I mean, it, you know, the draft was three days long, and I was sitting around for three days on the last day, still seeing players go in front of me who I knew I was better than, who I'd outcompeted, who I'd outperformed. Mm. But spending that year and a half away, the sentiment in a lot of NFL teams was, this guy's not serious about football. He's not committed to football. You see, he went to England. He went to Oxford to try to pursue education when – other guys, all they have is football. So we're going to invest money in guys who had nothing else but to play this sport, juxtaposed to this guy, Myron Roll, who if something gets a little bit tough in the NFL, he can go and leave and be a doctor. He can be a president. He can do something, can do something yeah. different. And so seeing all these guys get drafted in front of me, it was, it was painstaking. It was tough. It was tiring. It was depressing. But when I got that call from a 615 number and Jeff Fisher from the Tennessee Titans said, you know, are you ready to be a Titan? I said, absolutely. Now I have my opportunity. Now my foot was in the door. And it was a blessing to be drafted for sure. You signed your uh, a four year contract uh, in two thousand ten. Was that you said for fifty thousand for a four year contract? How much was that deal that you signed for in two thousand ten? It was a little bit north of a million, but um, uh, but the signing bonus was fifty thousand. That's what I oh, got okay, guaranteed okay. immediately to me. Okay. What, what did you get with your first two, when you first uh, got your first check at NFL? Oh man, I can't, I can't even remember what I got. I think I might have like took my parents out to eat or something like that. I'm not sure, but something very right. low key. I'm very conservative, so I didn't right. go. I didn't go crazy. You didn't. You didn't ball out. You didn't ball wild. Absolutely go crazy. not. That is not. That's not my character. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2010, you was chosen the second smartest athlete by Sports Sporting News, behind baseball player Craig Breslow. First of all, I don't know who Craig Breslow is, and I love. I like sports, baseball. Who is that? <laughs> I think it was a pitcher for the Oakland A's. I'm not sure. You know, I, I wish they can do it again and say, like, where have these guys gone now? Maybe he's right. gone and done wonderful things. But, uh, you know, my story has been well documented. I'm, I'm happy where I am and, and happy that uh, I'm able to use that list sometimes with my patients when they say, oh, Dr. Roll, I heard that you were a good football player. I say, yeah, I was also smart back then, too. You can look at this list. And <laughs> right, 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 the top. right. So hopefully you let me operate on your brain. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's all good. <laughs> um. 2012, you played for my team, you won my team, but you, I, that's, you didn't play much. You didn't play at all, it's the Steelers. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, no, I didn't play much. I was behind Troy, you know, uh, and so I was um, special teams behind him. And, and again, feeling 
that stigma, really that pressure, brother, that pressure of, uh, you know, there's other things that this young man can do. There's other things that he can go on and, and, and be, uh, whereas somebody else needs it. When I got released from the Steelers, uh, the general manager called me and said, you are playing very well. You are balling out here. So I said, okay, mm. well, why am I in front of you if this is the case? And he said, well, there's another guy who maybe not as good as you, but this is the only option that he has is football. But we're not worried about you. You're going to be great whatever you do. And mm. so I, I looked at that and said, well, I'm giving all of myself to this sport and I'm committing myself to this sport. If I wanted to go and be a doctor right now or be something else, I would have done that, but I'm choosing to continue to play this sport that I love. When I texted Troy Palomalu, Ike Taylor, Ryan Clark, my teammates, the other DBs on the team, uh, they were all shocked. They were like, man, you're playing so well, we can't believe it. But one thing we want you to know is that you did not embarrass yourself. You went out here and played well and you balled out. And so feeling that validation from my teammates who see me every day, who knew what I can do with my talent, that gave me a little bit more comfort. But it was definitely challenging to leave football because I felt like it was taken from me too early. But as I mentioned before, maybe there's a way that God was protecting me to make sure that I was still healthy enough right, to go right. on to my next chapter of my life. And so that's how I tried to flip it, try to spin it so that I didn't walk around with a burden and feeling like I was lamenting every second of the day. I said, let me focus on the MCAT, get into medical school, and then be a neurosurgeon to try to save lives. It's funny that um, what you said just pointed out to me, stuck out when you said, uh, cause that's all he has is to play football. You're gonna be all right. And I feel like I see like a lot of recruiters in all different sports, baseball, basketball, they rather go get, um, you know, football. They rather get that, that kid that, that's all he's doing. That's he has nothing else. He's so hungry. F parents, single parents, and, and instead of getting another kid that's probably well off, you know, both parents and is good, but still athletic, still talented. Let's get this kid right here because that's all he knows. He can't do anything else. Is that fair? Like, yeah, no, it's it's, it's not fair <laughs> to me, in my opinion. I think it's not fair to the athlete, either one of those type of athletes. One, because right. yeah, I, I feel that if once the sports leaves that person whether it be through injury or whether it be just their time is up, what do they do then, right? You just throw them away and then you don't help them be <laughs> good men, good leaders, good citizens. And you say, well, that's all he had and that's all we put into him and right. now he's done, we don't care about him anymore. But instead of thinking about the individual, the woman, the man, the athlete who has their eyes set on something beyond the sport. They're more than an athlete. They're not defined just by the helmet that they wear, the jersey that they wear. These are the kind of athletes that I want and these are the kind of athletes that I believe organizations and college and pros should try to foster and garner because these are the ones who are going to be great leaders and and uh, going to change the world one day. I, I, right. I, I tell people all the time, I, I'm biased, but I feel like athletes have the perfect design to go on and lead companies, to lead countries, to lead industry, because they know how to work together as a team. They know how to communicate. They know how to lose. And they know how to bounce back from that loss and have another win. They know how to prepare. They know how to communicate. They know how to take coaching. All these things that some people who don't understand the pressure it takes to play sports may not get. And so now I'm walking into my life as a physician. Not all athletes, though, man. Not all athletes. You got to have those leadership, those leader athletes that's, you know, could take over the team that took over the team. Because not every athlete, I don't think, like, when you say athletes, I'm just saying not all athletes, though. Yeah. Yeah, you know, some athletes will just ride on the bench and just rather just sit there and collect a check and steal the check. Let's be real, right? Cer some certainly, just, certainly. You, you, have, you have some outliers, no question. But I think large majority, if you were to juxtapose the athlete pool and population with maybe some of the others who are, you know, coming from affluent backgrounds, never been challenged, never had pressure, had everything given to them. I don't know. I just feel like the grind and the competitiveness that you have to take to push through some things mm, as an athlete is much different. You have challenges as a physician all the time that you go through, that you face. And I've seen my own personal eyes how people who have not come from this background uh, sometimes wilter under pressure. It breaks them. It busts pipes, right? That's what pressure can do. And then other times, those who have even a college or high school level athlete, they sort of tap into something that gets them through that challenging moment and gives them that resiliency right, right. and that toughness to make it through, women or men. So I, uh, I still hold true to that sentiment. I, I think mm -hmm. that athletes I have a great that. design. They won't crack under pressure because they're used to that, right? I can see that. Okay, so 2013, you announced that you were leaving uh, the NFL to attend uh, med, med school. What what actually turned that switch on now? I know that you said they released you, but what actually turned the switch on? Like, I'm going to go back to school, back to FSU, and, and, and take up medicine. 
Well, when I was in the fifth grade, actually, let me go back a little bit further. Uh, I read a book called Gifted Hands by Ben Carson, pediatric neurosurgeon, black gentleman from Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. separated two twins from the occipital lobe and had both of them live. Fantastic procedure, never had been done before. I, I, I valued his story. I valued his move towards being an outstanding scholar. Uh, and I looked at him as an academic hero of mine. So I knew once I was done playing football, the next move for me was going to be medicine and particularly neurosurgery because I fell in love with the brain. I thought the brain and the spine, the central nervous system uh, is such a beautiful system uh, that controls the way we speak, our body temperature, our language, how we control our heart rate, our respiratory rate. All of this comes from this small little gelatinous structure that we have to preserve in our head. And I just, I loved it. And I thought there was so much research to be done through it. And I thought that maybe if I'm a neurosurgeon, that I also could help the sport of football with concussions and CTE, some of the things mm -hmm. that my teammates were facing. So once I was done playing football, I prayed, talked to my mother, went back to my board that I had written down my, uh, my goals in life. One was playing NFL, cross it off. Next one was be a neurosurgeon. That was the next goal. And I had to take the 2% way process that I write about in my book to sort of move towards that goal. And so that's how it started. It's, it's, it's interesting to hear that, you know, like you a brain surgeon, like you just don't meet somebody that wants to be a brain surgeon young, you know, and you had your plan. Dope. Do you see a lot of black surgeons, brain surgeons in your field? Unfortunately not. Yeah, not a lot of uh, black neurosurgeons, not a lot of black female neurosurgeons. So the representation is certainly uh, quite low. I have a mentoring group that I work with young black men, pre-med and medical school who are interested in neurosurgery, trying to cultivate the next generation of neurosurgeons, especially at Ivy League schools uh, and Ivy League institutions like I'm at. It's, uh, it's imperative uh, that patients see us uh, in those, uh, those positions. And I'm trying to do everything I can to help that. So 2017, you graduated. Now you're officially a neurosurgeon. Got your residency at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Was that, how did you get to that point now? Like, was there, did you have to know people? Did you, you know, apply? Now it's like, cause this is now a different field now. Now you, it's not going to try out. You're not going to work out. So what was it to make you get into the, uh, you know, the Harvard Medical School and to be a, a resident at Massachusetts General Hospital? Absolutely. It's the best hospital in the country. You know, I'm kind of biased. It's, a, it's phenomenal. Great research, great uh, facilities, and nurses are amazing. Uh, and obviously the neurosurgical department is great as well. Uh, it took a lot of work, and it took shadowing of neurosurgeons in Florida, uh, working on my hand-eye coordination, my dexterity. I was tying knots as I was watching football on TV. I'd sit on my couch and tie knots, oh, surgical knots, over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I was doing dissections with my hands. I was eating with my left hand. I'm right-handed, but I was eating with my left hand to sort of make sure that I can hold the scalpel and the knife and the tissues of the brain tumors with both hands well. I was reading a lot of articles. I was talking to mentors. I was putting in the 2% grind every single day of getting a little bit better at all points of my life so that I can position myself to get into Harvard Medical School and to go to Massachusetts General Hospital because I knew it would train me to be a neurosurgeon who could take care of the most sick and vulnerable population. So uh, it was um, a great ride, a great journey, and uh, it's one that has put me in a position again to, uh, to stand out as a leader, uh, to be a scientist, and to help some people who uh, need it the most. Did you have to intern? Did you do any interning while, you know, during that process? So uh, the intern year is your first year of residency. Uh, and so you spend some time rotating on general surgery, neurology, other services that aren't neurosurgery. You also need to take a USMLE, like a board exam, uh, to get in and make sure that you're qualified academically. So there are some sort of metrics that you need to meet. Uh, but ultimately, the, the hospital... Uh, and the residency program has to favor you. You have to favor them. You both rank each other, you know, number one, number two, and, and the computer puts an algorithm together to see if you fall in line and match with that particular program, and then you move forward. And thankfully, uh, it, it worked out for me because it's been a blessing to be trained uh, at Mass General and see some of the most complex pathologies, not only in America, but around the world. And you're also married. You married as a dentist. Did you... Uh... Were you married before you became a neurosurgeon or after? I was not. No, I got married in my third year of residency. I met uh, LaToya okay. 
um, in my third year and uh, we started dating and then maybe about five months after we connected, uh, we got engaged and, and then got married. And then shortly after that, I uh, started having kids. And so now we have four kids, uh, two sets of twins. So our oldest set are about 22 months old. And then we have a new set that are about three weeks old. So we wow. have two sets of boy, girl, <laughs> twins. Boys, boys, a boy and a girl. Boy, boy girl, boy, girl. Mm -hmm. Boy, girl, boy, girl. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. So four four kids all together did the same thing your, your parents did with the Z. You did Z this time, not the M. That's right. Yeah, we kept the Z's. Yeah, we kept the Z's going. <laughs> <laughs> now, would you let any of your uh, kids, uh, your boys play football? It's a great question. Uh, I would. I would. I let uh, Zayed and I let Zafar play football because I know how much football really meant to me. Uh, right. how, it, how it helped me as a young person, sort of get out my temper and my anger and my rage a little bit, but also help me be competitive, help me learn how to lose, help me learn how to focus and have discipline. And it's given me the traits to allow me to be a good leader and a good physician. The one thing I would say is that the game, I think, needs to be changed where we have to shorten the game. We have to put better technology around the game, in the helmets, in the mouthpieces so we can censor some of these high velocity impact hits. We need to coach the game better. Some of the drills that I did as a young person, that's should not be applicable to the game today. So there has to be some changes involved, uh, but I love the sport of football. There's nothing like it. And uh, I, would, I would definitely let my kids play under the right circumstances. You said shorten the game. You're talking about the game itself or the season, the short, so less than a short four quarters? So I would shorten the time of each quarter. I would shorten the season, how many games people play. Because look, so we, we've done a lot of research on uh, how, how concussions and how repetitive concussions affect people down the line. If you played football in the NFL for over seven years, uh, especially NFL, but we do believe that there's some uh, um, correspondence and, and correlation to high school and college too. But if you played football for greater than seven years, your chances of getting ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, is tremendous, is exponentially high, way different than the equal population of people who haven't played football. So these degenerative diseases that you get, CTE, ALS, uh, early onset dementia and Alzheimer's, these sorts of things, they happen to people who play for a very long time. It doesn't matter how well you play, doesn't matter the position you play, doesn't matter the socioeconomic background you come from, but it's about length of play and length of time. And so I would not start playing football that early. Uh, I would sh shorten the games, the time of each quarter. I would shorten the amount of games in the season. And I would still allow the game to come forward and allow these young men and women, if they do play, uh, to make the money and to go to college and do all the wonderful things that football has afforded me and others like me to do. Uh, but I wouldn't have it be a situation that it will cause deleterious health consequences and so when they finish playing, they're worried about getting ALS and dementia and not remembering their kids' names at the age of 35 or something like that. 2020, you worked in a 24-hour emergency room shifts, like round the clock, round the clock, round the clock during the COVID. How was that for you? And how did that actually, you know, I guess you guys were trying to figure out what was the, you know, the relationship with COVID and the brain? How... What were you doing? Yeah, COVID was uh, was very difficult on all of us, especially our hospital. You know, we are the main hospital in the New England area. So any patient from Maine or New Hampshire, Vermont, they're not going anywhere else. They're coming to Boston and they're coming to see us. And so when our elective cases for neurosurgery got postponed, the shift turned to all of us trying to volunteer in the emergency department to take care of all these patients who were coming off the street with COVID. And so I didn't know anything about COVID. I had to learn. I was basically a foot soldier figuring out how this respiratory illness affected the lungs and the, uh, and the alveoli, you know, the cells in the lungs and how they cause this hyperinflammatory response. I was figuring it all out at once. But I think again, being an athlete, being adjustable and flexible and being able to adapt on the fly, just like I would change from a man to man in the first quarter to a zone in the second quarter, I understood I had to change up my whole routine to go and be help, helpful and help try to save some lives. And so it was very difficult, uh, but we made it through in that surge. We did still have to do a few neurosurgical cases, one in particular, a young man who was HIV positive, COVID positive, and had a, a disease called cryptococcal meningitis. I had to put a shunt in his head and then that was very, I had to do it very quickly because if you stay in that room very long, your chances of getting COVID was, was exponentially high. My wife was pregnant at the time. So there was all these concerns floating around, mm. but you had to sort of put aside your personal preference and you had to do the job because there are people who are counting on you. Wow, wow. 
February, 20, February 2021, um, you were as announced, Dr. Rose announced as a member of the board of directors for, um, what's that, Amboy Med? Amboy Med? Abbey Med. Abbey Med. That's an S &P, S &P, S P 500 company. Bro, that company is worth like billions. <laughs> like, how did that, how did that happen with you? Like, yeah, you know, that is actually a blessing. It, it, uh, I was taking care of some uh, pediatric patients at Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, one young man uh, was sitting there uh, and I just connected with him. And, you know, it wasn't anything different. I didn't have to operate on him. Didn't do any sort of surgery, no procedure. I just went to see him, visited him, see how he was doing, did his physical exam, talked to him and his parents. And his parent, uh, one of his parents was actually the president of this company, Abio Med, and they just mm. liked the way that I engaged with their child and engaged with the family, much different than any other care that they had gotten at that, uh, that particular institution. And so we stayed connected. Uh, next thing you know, there was a board position available, and now I'm able to be on this board. It's a medical tech uh, device company for, for heart and lungs and kidney. Uh, it does a great job recovering uh, these systems for people who are very sick, and being able to be a part of the leadership and, and direct initiatives that deal with vulnerable populations, marginalized populations, young people. Uh, it feels good to, to sort of take on a leadership role and, uh, and do it at a, a corporate level. So it's, it's been fantastic. Are you still involved in going, you know, um, helping the people out in, um, in Zambia? Are you still involved in that? So I spent six months in Zambia uh, doing pediatric neurosurgery, and that was a part of my global neurosurgery fellowship, a rotation that I did. I was in Lusaka, mm -hmm. the capital city, uh, just learning how to do surgery when lights would shut off, when electricity would go off, when there wasn't oxygen available, like when there was all sorts of things happening, wow. but yet you, you got to get the job done. And still, the Zambian neurosurgeons are phenomenal. They're able to work around the system and infrastructure deficits so well. It really helps give me a greater appreciation for how to do neurosurgery and how to really enjoy uh, taking care of these people who are very sick, who don't have any money, but they're coming to you in a hospital that may be you know, um, you know, not as uh, not as proficient as the one you're coming from in Boston, but it was a great experience. I loved it, and uh, it really prepared me for what I'm trying to do back home in the Bahamas and through the Caribbean, my Caribbean Neurosurgery Foundation, working in low to middle income countries and trying to meet those individuals who are very vulnerable, sick, and who don't have the access to care. Trying to meet them where they are. Do you, um, you did, uh, during your trip, I see that you had an uh, uh, operation on a, a young child. Tell us about that. Yeah, there was a, a young person from actually Malawi, so not very far from the border of eastern uh, Zambia. Uh, they came in. You know, the thing that you have in, in, in Zambia and Malawi and other low and middle income countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the kids uh, get infections in their brain. They get meningitis or some, some level of infection. And when they get infected, the membranes that sort of allow the fluid to flow, you have this natural fluid-filled centers in your brain, those membranes get scarred, they get thick, and they block the fluid. And so these kids end up getting really large heads, really big heads. Yeah. And so that's called hydrocephalus or macrocephaly is the type of head, but hydrocephalus is the, um, the, the actual disease. And so I saw this patient, saw the mother, talked to her through the interpreter and said, I would love to take your child to surgery because I think he would need it. Uh, I think this, this is something that is, has to happen. If we don't operate, one, they can die, or two, they could have... Uh, permanent developmental delay and be cognitively slow and regress than their peers. And so the mother agreed, signed informed consent. I put a shunt into the child's ventricle, uh, tunneled it behind the ear, underneath the skin, over the clavicle, down the chest and into the belly. So it was almost like they were drinking the fluid. And now I've done some follow-up on that child. The head is shrinking, the fluid is going down and they're doing much better and they're learning and developing just like any other child. So it was definitely a blessing wow. and a really good outcome. Wow, dope, man. Dope. Wow, nice, man. You got interesting stories, bro. <laughs> um, early this year now, another story that you on your see that your aunt had got into an accident when you um in Bahamas. And she was uh hurt a brain and she didn't get the attention that she could have got could if she was here, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh it was actually in 2010 when this happened. Um uh, I was oh, playing. It was, oh, it was 2010. It was 2010. Yeah, I was playing oh, for the Tennessee Titans. 
Uh, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, my aunt was in Exuma, Bahamas, our home family island. She was walking down the street. Her name is Anne, and uh, she was hit by a car and uh, had a traumatic brain injury. Went to our local clinic, did not get a CT scan, did not get an MRI, no diagnostic imaging, did not see a nurse, did not see a neurosurgeon. For seven hours, she waited in our local clinic, and then she ended up dying. The golden mm -hmm. window for seeing patients with traumatic brain injury, especially acute traumatic brain injury, is four hours. And so she saw, she didn't see anyone for seven hours, end up passing away. So that was the, wow. the impetus for me to start the Caribbean Neurosurgery Foundation because I knew it was a preventable death. If she had done that in Boston or New York or San Francisco or any major city, uh, any high income country part of, our, uh, part of America, she'd be alive with us today. We'd take off her skull, we'd evacuated the blood, we'd put the skull back on, send her to the ICU, have her go to physical therapy, have her walk around a little bit, and she'd be out of the hospital in three days, home in time for Sunday to mm. cook some peas and rice and go to church with us. So mm. all this stuff, I knew that this could have been prevented, and that, want, that willed me to start the Caribbean Neurosurgery Foundation to help upscale neurosurgical capacity in the Caribbean, particularly in the Bahamas, so this does not happen again to any other family. Wow, good. Um, released a book, The 2% Way. Explain what's The 2% Way. Yeah, The 2% Way uh, is, is, a, is a great philosophy and a mindset that I got from my football coach at Florida State University. His name was Mickey Andrews, and he would challenge me and my teammates every day to get a little bit better in our stamina, our ability to backpedal, our ability to high point the football. He just wanted us to have a real life, tangible goal of improvement. You know, some people say, man, I got 100% better today. That's impractical. You didn't double your talent in a day. But if you can right. get just a little bit better every single day, if you could win the days and keep stacking those days, then you can see a lot of progress and growth. And so mm. I extrapolated that ideology and that mindset to life so that any challenge or any obstacle, any goal, any task that I tried to accomplish, I applied this small steps, 2% consistent steps towards a better version of myself. And so this book talks about coming from the Bahamas, talks about going to Jersey, Florida, England, uh, now uh, to Boston and Harvard neurosurgery, and how the challenges that I face from self-doubt to racism, to prejudice, to geographically being distanced from my wife, to workplace challenges, to feeling like I'm socially awkward in some certain settings, how I mitigated these challenges by applying this 2% way, blocking out the background noise, taking small steps every day and seeing my growth and being a better version and a, and a better person at the end of the day. So we're excited about it. Right, you're not making, doing 100% <laughs> turnaround right away. I get it. Um, gotta ask you, Antonio Brown, he claims he doesn't have CTE, right? You can't, you can't really check CTE once a person's wrapped. Why is that though? Well, we don't have the technology yet to diagnose, to diagnose it uh, based on uh, imaging, right? So you can't get a CT or mm -hmm. MRI just yet. Uh, and, you know, there is no um, sort of blood test to look uh, for any sort of protein markers yet. These are all things that are being worked on by neuroscientists. Only can see it, as you alluded, uh, when you're dead and you have an autopsy, you can actually look at the protein deposits in the brain physically. It's kind of weird because I'm feeling like we're so advanced, so much advanced, you would think that they could see this. Shoot, they could tell us the weather in two weeks. <laughs> they can't, right? And you can't tell us that, that if this person has CTE, you bring a brain uh, surgeon, neurosurgeon, like uh, are you saying that they're working on this. Don't you think that this is something they should have like had right away, right? Or like now? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, there's growth and there's progress being made in that, that particular field and, and it would be great because I think people throw around CTE often to describe behaviors that may be different or abnormal or doesn't seem mm -hmm. like uh, it fits with the societal norms. And there may be other things happening in someone's life that's not related to CTE, but because it's something that we know, we throw a blanket statement over a lot of football players that this is what they yeah, have. Let's just, right dismiss, the right. let's just dismiss them because they have CTE and that's it. But you know, there's other challenges. I mean, think about playing professional football and getting paid like this and getting attention and lights and camera and getting all this love and then that stops and then you have to go and be a regular citizen. That could be depressing, that could be hard on people, that could send your moods in, in you know, all sorts of different areas. Your pain could be not tolerated very well so you're relying on 
pain medications to sort of mitigate that. So there could be a lot of factors confluent all within your body working towards, you know, a, a very dangerous outcome. It doesn't all have to be CTE. So I think we should be a little bit more cautious when we use that term Zero because term, right. it's not something that we can say as scientists, as, as medical professionals right now, just clinically seeing a patient. We can suspect it, but we can't definitively define it unless we, um, you know, have somebody in autopsy and look at the protein under a microscope. But when we say that, they go through that. There's other people that actually have nine to five jobs and then then they're not doing that. You know, they could be depressive. They could be going down. So happens to a lot of people, football or not. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's uh, stressors that, you know, release chemicals in our brain, uh, cortisol in particular, uh, that, you know, increase our blood pressure, uh, that put on weight, that put hair onto our body, that have these striations in our body, uh, that make us feel anxious, that have our renal system not work as well, that have our heart pumping differently, that change our eyesight. I mean, all of this sort of work. So when people say stress, stress is not just a nebulous concept. It is something that actually activates a process in the body and particularly in the brain that really can slow you down and prevent you from being your optimal self. And so I take that very seriously. We all as neuroscientists mm -hmm. take it very seriously. And, you know, the idea is to try to put these individuals, whether you're working a nine to five job or whether you're a former professional athlete, put you in front of the right individuals to talk through these issues, the clinicians to help you mitigate these challenges and help you be a best version of yourself where you're not harmful to yourself. You're actually productive uh, for you and your community. Um, I used to hang out with this dude and he was like a good friend of mine, Aaron Hernandez, and he suffered one of the most severe CTs ever that they saw it, right? And do you think that that played a role in the murders and the suicide? You know, I, th I think it possibly could have, you know. Uh, I know Chico was, um, you know, was somebody who was well loved by a lot of individuals and, you know, he had some challenges as well. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, when they did the the look under the microscope of his brain, they saw the protein deposits, especially in the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is a part of the brain that controls executive functioning, aggression, violence. Uh, it, it controls personality. So you can see people change if they have an insult or an injury to this particular part of your brain. And it's not something that they're trying to do. Literally, their brain is being sort of hijacked based on these degenerative proteins that are being placed in this particular lobe in the brain. If the if wait, wait, I'm sorry to cut you off. Like you said, you could see this the 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 uh, the aggressiveness in, in the brain. You could see that in the brain. What you just say? So I'm the sorry. frontal lobe uh, helps control your your mood and your executive functioning and your personality. And so the aggression that comes from people who have a disinhibited frontal lobe uh, can be a result of having the CTE or the protein deposits or a bleed or an infection or a tumor that hits that particular lobe in the brain. And so, you know, when, when, you, when you think about somebody like Aaron or others uh, who have resorted to violence, who have been a little bit more aggressive than, uh, than you know, maybe norm, uh, than they have shown in the past, uh, you have to think that there is an insult, there's an injury to that area, and you can sort of correlate where this protein and where this injury and where this degeneration is happening with the actions mm -hmm. that they're doing. And so those two things can go together, and it's unfortunate that it happened for him and the outcome that happened. Oh, okay. Wow, man. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. I could, I could go on for a long, long time, but I know we got to go. Appreciate you, Dr. Rowe. Um, this is an interesting, interesting conversation, man. Thank you. Because I'm always, I'm used to talking to these rappers and stuff like that, but speaking to the doctor and, you know, getting this information is well needed. And he gave me that one-on-one. -on -one. Appreciate you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you, man. Good luck in everything you're doing, man. Yes, sir. We need guys like you, bro. Thank you. Thank you.